ago, I was uh, preaching uh, a sunrise service, and uh, it was still dark, and uh, it reminded me of a, a story I'd heard from uh, uh, one of the great theologians of uh, this century, of the last century, who was living during the time of the bombing of the uh, London Blitz, if you remember in the beginning of World War II and the Germans bombed London. And uh, this uh, theologian said it best. He said, he said uh, when asked, was he afraid of the bombs? Was there fear of the bombs? And he said, no. He said, I have a greater fear and a fear that I've held much longer in my life. He said, my fear is not the bombs. My fear is the darkness when the lights Go out. Sometimes we're afraid of things that we've been afraid of for a long time. Sometimes it's things that are not really justified to have those kind of fear over. Sometimes we're afraid of things that have come upon us suddenly. But I heard this phrase used recently, and it is this thing, that fear is about not so much what we know or about the things that we know about, i.e. bombs or whatever. Fear sometimes is that we don't know what's going to happen next. That's one of the great fears. I think about that a lot when I read this scripture because this is a scripture, as I said in my little article yesterday, that gives Thomas kind of a nickname, Doubting Thomas. I really believe that's a serious question. Do you think many people called him that, and do you think he mind being called Doubting Thomas. First, I don't know that many people called him that because the record of Thomas is pretty solid. In fact, if you read the scripture, it's Thomas who finds himself saying when Jesus says, let us go and do so-and-so, he says, well, let's go and die with him. In other words, maybe his name should have been Courageous Thomas or Brave Thomas. But somehow he's gotten the nickname Doubting Thomas. But the scripture is not so much about doubting Thomas and the part that I want to sort of talk about and share with you today briefly is the part about where it says at the very beginning of the scripture, on by the way, which would have been Sunday evening, Easter evening, maybe 8, 10, 12 hours after the disciples had gotten the news that Jesus was risen, it says that they were still behind locked doors. Locked doors. I don't know about you, but uh, blocking doors is something that uh, we've never been particularly good at. We, we, we've actually had Don Roulet come to our house two or three times when we were younger and had children because somebody uh, who was told to lock the door and they locked the wrong door or they locked the door and they didn't have the key. That's a frustrating thing to lock your doors and not have your keys. So when we lock something up, when we lock something to keep something in, I, I kind of understand that, but when we lock something to keep people out, it's not something we've been very commonly doing in our own house and community. Now, don't go over there and find the door locked today because you will because we're protecting you from our dog. We don't want him to get out. We don't want him to get out and get you. But if I thought about it, and I thought about it, for a very long, I would say that when you find someone locked in out of fear or they've shut their door or they put up a wall or they've locked their windows or they've done something, it's generally because of a fear. And that fear is generally not about what they know is going to happen. It's more about what they 
think is going to happen. In fact, sometimes it's really just fear about what may or may not happen because they don't really know. Now, I'm going to put yourself in the disciples' place. The disciples know this, that Jesus has done. And they know this from some women, that the grave is empty and there's, the stone has been rolled away and a message about going to meet him in Galilee has been given. That's in John's Gospel, by the way. John and Peter know because they've run to the grave and they've looked in and they've seen that the grave is empty. So that's all they know, but they don't really know what's going to happen next. And so they lock down, they shut down still. When Thomas comes a week later, can I say this? They're still locked in. They're still shut down. And yet no one says, uh, there's, there's uh, scaredy cat Peter or uh, fearful John or uh, a timid uh, uh, Matthew or any of the other disciples. No, but somehow he gets this name because he expresses and by the way, I think he was actually pretty brave because on Easter evening when Jesus comes, all the other disciples are there, but Thomas isn't. So he was at least brave enough to go out amongst the people in the community and be identified possibly as one of Jesus' disciples. And as Charles said in Bible study, that carried a pretty great penalty, or so they thought. But I want to ask you this this morning. What is it with all of the great things that we do as a church, with all the great things we believe, and with all the things that we are, is it possible that in some ways we are still not like Thomas so much, but like the early church? We're still locked down. We're still shut down. And I'm not speaking of COVID, and I'm not speaking of vaccines. I'm speaking of fear of what we don't know will happen next. Um, Many, many years ago, uh, there was, a, uh, I guess, a book that came out, and it was by John Ortberg, and it said this. It said, it, it said to, to, to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. I think that was the paraphrase of the title. We're sort of in the boat, people, when we're in church. Most of the people around the world that we want to share this good news of the resurrection with are actually out there on the water. And many of them are floundering and some of them are drowning. In fact, some of them are in so deep they, they don't know if they're going to make it or not. So maybe we need to ask that question and ask it specifically. What happens when we find ourselves fearful? to step out, to unlock? What happens when we begin to doubt what we are doing or when we wonder what we should do next? What happens to a church and do that? I, I do know this, that, that John, who wrote the Gospel of John, is writing the Gospel later on. He's not writing this the week or two after Easter. He's writing it after there's been a period of time and the Gospel has been uh, promulgated or gone out in the world. Paul has already preached his missionary journeys there are already churches established throughout the, that part of the world. And so when John writes about the resurrection and when he writes about Thomas, he's writing it to tell us that there are all sorts of responses to this idea of resurrection. There were some people who said, I won't believe it till I see it, Thomas. There were some who said, well, I've heard about it and I've even seen the empty tomb, but I'm still afraid. And I would imagine that when John wrote the gospel and when we read it in the modern context, we have the same things. John writes at the end of his book, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but those are written so that you, these are written so you may have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of the church, as I said in Bible study Wednesday, the purpose, the mission statement of the church, no church need write a real, real mission statement of their own because here's the mission statement. The purpose of the church is to be the vehicle by which people come to believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing they may have life in his name. So I think that when we read John this morning, we're reading this. As John Stott said, we're reading the promise 
to not only those who believed in the first century, but to those who believe in our century, that when we hear the story of God's love, we come to faith and are blessed. Faith, after all, is hard, he says, and believing something you haven't seen is especially hard. So John writes, records the story of Thomas, and we read of someone who says, I've got to have my fingers in this. I've got to have a hands-on experience. I've got to have that. I'm that way. I'm sort of like folks from Missouri. I need to be shown real proof. So I don't think we want to say that Thomas is negative unless we want to say that all those other disciples who had the doors locked out of fear for the Jews and out of whatever fears they had were possibly uh, fearful as well. Peterson, the great Presbyterian preacher and writer who translated the message, if you have that translation at home on yourself, said that. He said, the disciples were like all of us. He said, they were afraid when they were suddenly caught off guard and didn't, don't know what to do. We're afraid when our presuppositions and assumptions no longer account for what, what we're up against. And we don't know what will happen to us. We're afraid when reality without warning is shown to be either more or other than we thought it was. The reality is that Jesus has come and preached and lived and healed and forgiven and predicted his own death and died and now they're faced with the prediction of his resurrection. So what happens next? We don't know. Peterson says this, he says, maybe we need to exchange fear of the Jews or fear of what will happen next for this healthy fear. He calls it fear of the Lord, a fear of the Lord that keeps us on our toes with our eyes open. Something is going on around here. We don't want to miss it. Fear of the Lord prevents us from thinking this, that we know it all, that we have all the answers. Fear of the Lord, therefore, prevents us from closing off our minds or our perception from, what, from something new. Fear of the Lord prevents us from acting presumptuously and therefore destroying or violating some aspect of beauty, truth, or goodness that we don't recognize or don't understand. Fear of the Lord, he says, makes us open. Open to what God can do next. Perhaps if we had been the disciples in the upper room that evening, we would have said, well, gosh, we read about that back in our Old Testament. And it kept saying, fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And fear of the Lord and all those Psalms that we read in Proverbs. And maybe we need to go back to that. Maybe our a healthy fear is not fear of the Jews or fear of what's going to happen next. Those are unhealthy fears. Maybe the healthy fear, the spiritual fear, is the fear of God, of the Lord. It opens us up, makes us ready to receive. I've had to admit that I've had doubts at time. The, one of the great preachers I knew in my earlier preaching days, a Methodist preacher, used to say this. He said, there's no such thing as somebody without doubts. There's only people who can't admit they have them. I've experienced times where I thought, boy, I don't know if this is going to make it. There was recently, I don't know, in the last five or six years, there was one a great evangelical preacher, conservative, almost we would call him fundamentalist preacher, who decided one day, it was a Sunday after Easter, that he no longer believed what he believed and he just kind of walked away from his church and walked away from religion. And, and a good friend followed him. He had left where he was up in Minnesota and he went out to California and someone caught him and said, Rob, his first name was Rob, and he said, Rob, he said, have you really lost your faith? Have you really lost, are you really doubting so much that you don't believe in Jesus? He said, I guess I would put it this way. He said, I always believe so strongly. I thought you had to doubt this strongly as well. We think that. And so we run or we lock doors or we hide or we move away or we put a title on ourselves, I'm no longer a believer, or I'm deconstructing my faith is the popular term now. But I will tell you this, that there are doubts, and we've all had them. And it may not be as something as uh, deeply spiritual as the understanding that God has come to give us life, but it may be something as simple as what's going to happen next. 
I remember watching um, the movie, the rerun of it from probably the 50th time I've seen it. The Blues Brothers was on this week. Y'all know that movie? And it's a, great mo it's a great spiritual lesson in the movie because the Blues Brothers have just, one has just gotten out of prison, the other one should have been in prison. And they're just trying to decide what they're going to do with their lives. They're in a blues band and the band has been disbanded because they they're the leaders and they've been knocked out of commission. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. And all of a sudden they figure out that the orphanage they stayed in as children is going to be sold for taxes to the city of Chicago. And so they figure out that they're going to raise the money to pay the taxes. And they use the expression that they're on a mission from God. See, I think in this passage, there are three things that go on that we need to be totally aware of. First of all, that when Jesus says, peace be with you, that he's not simply talking about, hey, how are you doing today? This is not, a, this is not just a, even a greeting the way a Hebrew would have greeted another Hebrew. Shalom, meaning I hope for you that everything will work out fine and that you'll be prosperous and healthy and that your children will be okay and that, that your business will run fine. No, it's, a, it's an expression. Somebody said it in Bible study Wednesday. It's an expression. Peace be with you that the kingdom of God is in you. Peace be with you first time just to calm them down. Just to relieve their fears. Just to say God's here. And he's present. But then the second time he says peace be with you, he, he gets a little different. He says peace be with you and he says it in reference to what they're supposed to do. Their mission from God. What their job is. And he says as the Father has sent me, I send you. Peace be with you. In other words, you can't, you've got the kingdom, now go and share it. And then the third time he says it, he says, peace be with you. And he says, sins are forgiven. <clears throat> sins are forgiven. Oh my goodness. So in this moment of great fear, and in this moment of the most doubting disciple we get record of in the scriptures. We have Jesus saying, it's okay, I'm here. I have a mission for you to do. And it includes forgiveness of sins. My goodness. If our church were to decide today, if we were to say, well, what, what's our purpose? What's, what are we going to do here today? What, what's going to happen we might even say, we could say this. What is it that Thomas says at the end of his realization that God is present, that he has a mission, and that his sins have been forgiven, even his doubt? What is it he says? My Lord and my God. Well, maybe, maybe I need to ask this question of all of us today. What would it take for me to say that today, for us to say that today, for us to reconfess that today in the light of Easter, what is it that would prompt us to say, my Lord and my God in the midst of our fears? What would it take? Do we long to see Jesus in our presence like Thomas? Do we look for a loving and accepting community of believers? Do we want to be that? Do we hope to see that the message of God's love and grace will be witnessed out through us and to all of our community? Do we seek or do we seek to just lock the doors and keep things the way they are even if it means being fearful and doubting and wondering what's going to happen next. I think I know the answer. I'm asking you as a church. I think you already know the answer. I think you've already decided on the answer. And the answer is no, we want to be like Thomas. We want to see and believe. We want to be like the disciples, set free, not simply to be afraid and locked up and locked down, but we want to be like the disciples who are ready to go and share and to be in the presence of Jesus and to be full of forgiveness. See, I think there are upper rooms all over post-Easter. 
This just happens to be where the disciples were on that first Easter. But we're a, an upper room in a sense. We're an upper room full of disciples who are full of fears and doubts and wonders and what's going to happen next? What do we do now? Where do we go from here? And Jesus comes and says, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It's okay. I'm here. Peace be with you. You have a mission from God. Peace be with you. You can forgive and be forgiven. My goodness. If I came to church every Sunday and that's the only thing I heard, and I heard it consistently, it'd be enough. That we, as 21st century disciples, have a choice to make. And that choice involves being the presence of Jesus, accepting his forgiveness, and believing in the mission that he's given us. My goodness. It's interesting that after Thomas stuck his fingers in the hand, and there's a great painting by Caravaggio, one of the uh, Renaissance painters, and it actually has a picture of Thomas peering as, as if he were looking under a microscope and he's looking and he's not just putting his fingers in the hand, he's literally poking his fingers down into the side of Jesus where his wound is. And the, in the background you see the other disciples and they're looking and they're like pointing and saying, what do you see Thomas? What's in there? Is it really him? Is he really wounded? There's a world of people who wonder what's going to happen next to them. There's a world of people in our community who wonder what's going on in their lives. There's a world of people who you know and who you come into contact with just about every week who are asking the same questions that Thomas did and who want to believe and all they're waiting for is someone to bring them into the presence of Jesus. And that's our mission. And that's what we're called to do with the peace of God in our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, there are doubters here this morning. There are those with fears. And there are those who, who feel like it's safer when we just kind of lock the doors and Say to ourselves. But Lord, Jesus comes into the upper room on Easter evening and again on a week later and his purpose is not so that the disciples will stay as they are but so that they'll be transformed. And his purpose is not so that their doubts and fears will come, become even deeper and harder in their lives but so that their fears and their doubts will be relieved. And Lord, we celebrate that you've come into our presence today. We know you did. We welcomed you here. We invited you into our presence, and you are here, and you are speaking to us now with that same voice. Peace be with you. I'm here. And you're speaking to us. Peace be with you. I've given you a mission. And you're speaking to us. Peace be with you. I forgive you. For your doubts for your fears. Now go in peace. And Lord, teach us and lead us in that way to be filled with peace. And even when we fail to find the words to pray, give us these words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll stand together and we'll sing in our hymnal, excuse me, hymn, hymn number uh, 494. Jesus, joy, thou joy of love and heart. 400.
that you will hear in some way or fashion this week the words 